Okay, so welcome to the next video in our video series. I'm just going to introduce you to Robin. Unfortunately, Robin's in hospital at the moment, but has very kindly agreed to still be part of our video series, which is wonderful. Um, and so I'm just going to firstly introduce Robin. So Robin graduated for, from Imperial College London with a degree in chemistry and management science. Robin was then a scientist before becoming a manager in the transport sector. Robin studied law at the University of Exeter next and is now a discrimination and employment law barrister practicing at Old Square Chambers. Robin made history by becoming the first barrister to transition in practice at the discrimination bar in 2011. So Robin practices in all aspects of employment and discrimination law and lectures uh, regularly on the area, including transgender rights, in which she has appeared in a number of notable cases too, and she acts for both employers and employees. Chambers and Partners has described Robin as the go-to uh, lawyer for trans cases, and she has published a practical guide to transgender law in 2021, which she wrote jointly with Nicola Newbe Newbegin, is it Newbegin, Trap uh, okay, um, <laughs> of Old Square Chambers. Robin is also a contributor to discrimination law. So Robin also recently won the award for outstanding contribution to diversity and inclusion at the Chambers UK Bar Awards. So she's very well established and a fantastic barrister amongst many other things, as we can see. So by way of introducing the chat, Robin, firstly, thank you so much for kindly agreeing to have a chat today, especially in the circumstances. Um, it's part of our video series for LGBTQ plus history month, which is of course in February. As you know, we're having a chat with people who are members of the LGBTQ plus community and are thriving in the legal profession, which we hope will be inspiring for the members of the LGBTQ plus online network society at ULaw and anyone else who might be watching or listening. We're especially hoping that our videos will be inclusive of our many international members. Um, these people aren't able to take part in our online events, unfortunately, due to their wishes to remain anonymous. Their anonymous participation is mostly due to the fact that the LGBTQ plus community are not accepted in the countries that they live and that they work in or they study in. Um, so we're hopeful that the series will not only be a way to include those members, but it will also act as a beacon of hope that you can be your true authentic self and thrive in the legal profession. So as a key example of that, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to ask you a few questions, um, but the first set of questions is going to have a legal focus. So Robin, you're a barrister practising at New Square Chambers. Can you tell us a bit about why you chose these chambers in particular? Old Square Chambers, actually. Oh, sorry, um, Old Square Chambers. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a um, famous picture. Uh, we have a, a little annex in Bristol with brass plate um, outside that used to say Old Square Barristers. And there was a picture of two barristers stepping out of the front door. And I would say that the last thing that people from Old Square are, are either old or square. <laughs> uh, it's just, um, Old Square is just, just a lovely place to practice from. I mean, it, it's a bit, it's a little frightening in that you're amongst giants um, in, in terms of the profession. Um, you know, people are at the cutting edge of various um, bits of um, law of one sort or another. They're just very good. But they're also proper in an old fashioned barristery way in that we don't do tricksy stuff. You know, if we say something, we mean it. Um, we, we keep proper professional standards um, and we work darn hard for our, our clients. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, I mean, I, I for example, have been a member, uh, I, th I think get for getting on for 15 years now. And I've shared a room with the same other two members mm. for all that time. And we just get on together. And mm. so do people in chambers. And it's not, and in fighting at the bar is not always wrong. It shows a bit of liveliness between barristers. Um, but Old Square is just a lovely place to be. It's a, just a tremendous uh, collegiate atmosphere. And it's, mm. it's, a, a privilege to be a member of Old Square. Amazing, thank you. I was looking at um, Old Square obviously when preparing for our conversation, it looks like a fantastic set and I also found it quite interesting that you practice in both Bristol and London because as an aspiring barrister you sort of look into different uh, sort of circuits that you might practice on but it seems like you get, sort of get the best of both worlds by having um, being able to practice at both. Um, well we found at one point we had a focus of people who were living in Bristol. It's it's probably less tricky now than it was. Mm. 
but it's it's more a matter of doing things like um you know if we go and give a talk to an external firm of solicitors or group or whatever what we'll generally do is pair up um a senior member of chambers and a more junior member of chambers uh which gives that junior member some exposure the opportunity to grow their practice the opportunity to be, to, to be seen and and frankly the solicitors the opportunity to instruct people because often the the busier members of chambers have quite full diaries mm. um so you know we do sensible things like that that allow junior people and and we're privileged obviously to um you know s scrape a bit of cream off the top of the milk in terms of the juniors that we take each year so mm. Fantastic. Um, and you specialise in all aspects of employment and discrimination law. Could you tell us a little bit about your area of practice and why you chose that in particular? Yeah, I was uh, I was an employer before I was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. and I find people infinitely fascinating um, and the interaction between people. And I n always wanted a job that was people focused. And so, yeah, you might make a fortune if your practice involves working out who's responsible for which oil tanker bumped into which oil tanker in Hong Kong Harbour. Mm. But it, in my respectful view, it won't be anywhere near as interesting as working out who sacked who and why. Mm. That's fantastic. I think a lot of people who will be watching this will be doing the GDL. So it's so interesting to know what you can bring to your practice as someone who has um, worked in a different profession before coming to uh, the legal professional before coming to the bar. So that's amazing that you've been able to take your experiences from before um, and that's helped make you a brilliant barrister. OK, so um, sorry. It's a bit of a tradition of, for example, uh, bright young policemen who are then injured on duty. Um, transferring to become criminal barristers or people with experience moving into areas that are relevant to practice that they've had before or ex life experience they've had before. I mean, I have to say, as a junior barrister, junior employment barrister, it, appearing in front of the employment tribunals to have actually hired and fired, fired people um, gave you the opportunity to speak the same language as the tribunal. And and it, it wasn't a theoretical as it is for some junior people. You know, you'd been there in the mucky scrabble of the workplace mm. and that was important. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. So um, we, as I mentioned, we're doing the series for LGBTQ plus history month. Um, and we were hoping to highlight in the series the practical effects of being an LGBTQ plus person, uh, particularly in the legal profession. And we wanted to have a focus on the positive steps that have been or could be taken to make the profession better for everyone. So with this in mind, would you be able to tell us a little bit about your own experience as a trans woman who actually transitioned whilst at the bar? Yeah, I, I um I've got one or two good legal friends who would say that I was always, um, uh, you know, a reasonable barrister to spend time with and um, would work well. But there was always a core of me that you couldn't get at. There was something there that was hidden away, at least partially. And when I transitioned, there no longer was. I didn't, you know, the thing that was hidden didn't have to be hidden anymore. Um, and some some people ask what being trans is like and if you could imagine being a fundamentally honest person and effectively lying by your behavior every day mm. um then you know that's that's one example of it um most lgbt people have found themselves in that circumstance at some point during their life in one way or another mm -hmm. so uh and what i think uh, i didn't realize quite how important um, role models were. Um, I now get quite involved with bar school students and they tell me, the LGBT students tell me that to see people like them out there in the profession um, doing reasonably well um, gives them confidence that, you know, it's not a bar to them being in, in the profession, that they're not going to face the boundaries that they did, that, that people did years ago. Um, I mean, until within my within my practice life, you 
you couldn't be openly gay and be a judge. Hmm. You know, that was that was true 25 years ago. It, it's no longer true. Well, it's absolutely no longer true. Hmm. I think that's an amazing answer. I think I'm touching on your first point about honesty. The profession is meant to all be about your integrity as a person. And we're all honest people. And that upholds the um, fact that the, the profession is so well respected. And I completely um completely relate to that experience of feeling like you can't be truly honest when you're um, not being necessarily tri uh, truthful about what you did at the weekend or who you're with or wh whatever it might be. And I think that sense of relief when you can be honest with people and you can be authentic is so impactful in how productive you can be or how you get on with your colleagues because, um, yeah, you can just be more authentic. So I think I'd, that def definitely resonates with me and probably a lot of people listening to this. And I also think there's a huge importance on role models, like you said, um, and that's why we did the video series so we can have people who are um, thriving in the legal profession and are being their true selves. I think that's so important for people who are trying to enter the profession or who are uh, sort of junior to be able to see. I've said before in a different video that I felt like when I met LGBTQ plus people who were thriving in the legal profession that I felt like I it was almost like permission to be who I want, who, who I really was and um, because I could see them. Uh, doing well so I sort of could see into my future and I could see that I could also do well and be who who I really was but I think your use of the word confidence is probably much better I think it is a sense of confidence that you gain um rather than permission which is probably a bit more negative yeah. I mean I I used to be skeptical about things like um you know flying flags or this that and the other um I still have a strong connection with the rail industry mm. and southeastern trains spent a hundred pounds on two fifty pound rainbow reps to put round the front of a train mm. um that just just paste you know five, five vinyl reps that put a rainbow on a train and the response they got from their lgbt staff just from doing that was so positive mm. uh, that the staff felt that someone had just taken a moment to think of them yeah and I, I was cynical about things like that until I heard what the reaction was to that to that vinyl rep. You know, and yeah. there, there's an example, slightly different area of endeavour. But yeah. No, I think it definitely creates a feeling of like being supported and being included. And uh, that, you're right, it, it just took a moment for that person to think of it. And it didn't take much money. But that small act made the people, the employees feel so much better and so much more part of um, the their, their work environments. So that's lovely. Um, OK, so Robin, you'll no doubt have noticed and um, probably also unfortunately been affected by the heightened vilification of trans people in the media recently. Um, so trans issues are being debated more frequently and the perspectives that are given and comments that are made that I have come across personally, um, I feel have been outright transphobic. Um, would you be able to give your views on how this affects trans people and what the legal sphere can do to support trans people? Well, it, it certainly does affect people because having your very existence debated, mm. uh, frankly, by people who don't have a stake in the game is horrible. Mm. Um, having it used as a political football is especially horrible. Um, at the moment, the current government have no real idea how to uh, steer us out of the economic troubles that we're in. And we've just had their deputy chairman, I think, saying that the next election, they're going to fight the next election based on culture wars, um, the, which means they're going to lose heavily, but they've just got nothing else that their um, their voter base likes them for. Uh, and so they're just going to be nasty to people who some of their voter ba ba base likes them seeing being nasty to. Mm. Um, we, we've a media who are happy to play along with that because it obviously sells newspapers or clicks on the internet. Um, and we've just got to face it out. The next general election is 22 months away, something like that at the moment. So if it's strung out, uh, so, I mean, by, by which time, presumably every Conservative MP will have been Prime Minister. Um, and we, we've just got to face that out and better times are coming. Uh, the um, unpleasantness has to be faced in this in this period. Uh, we have to stand together, hold each other's hand um, and 
we'll get through it in exactly the same way that um, uh, lesbian, gay and bisexual people have so far. Um, you know, there are many things now that you can't say about LGB people that you appear to be able to say about T people. Um, those awful links, um, the, the game that politicians play to get the word paedophile or criminal into the same sentence as trans in exactly the same way that 25 years ago people played that game with gay people. Can't do that now with gay people and we'll get to the other side of this. But we've just got to have confidence, as I say, stand together and and in 20 years time we'll look back on this and laugh. Yeah, absolutely, completely agree. I think what you said about people uh, expressing opinions um, that don't have a stake in the game. My um, alarm clock is a radio and I listen to Radio 4 or LBC and you hear people having uh, debates about trans issues and there's been, I don't think I've listened to a single trans person give their perspective um, or their experience or, and you know, maybe it's because it would be exhausting for trans people to constantly have to fight the battle and it is for other people to get involved. But I think it has been heavily biased in my experience, which has been really disheartening. Um, but yeah, in terms of the culture wars and the fear mongering, I think you're right. I think if, if that's really poignant what you said about holding each other's hand and um, everyone can get involved in, um, Join, join the fight and try to, um, if you don't know anything about it, maybe do educate yourself. And if you don't, um, and I've just said, if you don't have a stake in the game, it's um, uh, not best to get involved in a negative way. But even if you don't have a stake in the game, it's good to um, educate yourself and know what's going on. And if you can uh, stick up for someone else, definitely do. Surveys show, surveys mm. of the public show, that members of the public who either know a trans person Mm. or of met person have tend to have very different views of um on the subject these subjects so you're right it's one of the reasons why i'm prepared to put myself out there publicly and it's the right thing to do and also um you know right thinking people who would like to understand what the true position is go and find a trans person and talk to them about it if mm. they're willing um and as you say educate yourself yeah absolutely okay so uh, sort of on that positive note of educating yourself and um fighting the good fight we also wanted to offer lots of support and encouragement to lgbtq plus people who are considering or are pursuing a legal career and one way of doing this is to let them know that there are people like them who are thriving in the legal world. So as you mentioned, uh, role models are really important. Um, but with this in mind, what piece of advice or encouragement would you personally offer an aspiring barrister who is trans? Focus on being the best barrister you can. Mm. That's what matters. Ultimately, business doesn't mind business, whoever's going to instruct you. Don't mind whether you're blue, pink, black, black grey with yellow spots uh, or whatever. Mm. They, they want to win their case mm. and therefore need to focus on being the best barrister you can be. And that's the most important thing um, as far as career is concerned. Mm. Um, and don't be distracted by, by that worry. Oh, gosh, I'm trans or LGBT or whatever, um, am I going to be accepted? Just get on and do the work, learn your stuff, um, pass your exams and find a decent place in a decent chambers. Fantastic, thank you. Um, OK, so we also in the video series wanted to talk about LGBTQ plus opportunities just because we want to encourage our members or anyone else who's LGBTQ plus who's listening um, to either give back or also to take up opportunities that are available to them or to underrepresented groups generally, um, because these can be great, if nothing else, but for being able to build a network of other LGBTQ plus people, which is um, going to be really supportive and inclusive. So, um, Robin, you are judging the LSE Featherstone Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Moot this year, I believe. Um, I spoke with Lawrence. I may be. Um, Maybe. I, it depends whether I'm out of hospital in time. We, we'll have okay. to see. OK. Um, we spoke with Lawrence Hiller Wood in this series, who actually took part in the inaugural Featherstone Moot. He was horrified to realise um, and mentioned that you were the judge back in 2016 when that took place. 
So um, I imagine that you have done it. You at least did it at the inaugural one. You were prepared to do it this year. You may have done it in between. I'm not sure. Um, but could you tell us a little bit more about the MOOC? Yeah, um, it takes place at LSE, unsurprisingly, mm -hmm. over a, a, a weekend, well, a Friday and a Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, usually at this time of year, been a bit lumpy the last couple of years because we've had to work around COVID. Mm -hmm. COVID. Um, and it's open to teams from institutions around the UK and abroad. Um, and the moot problem always has an LGBT slant to it, um, aspect to it, whatever. Um, and the uh, early rounds all the way through, the judges are significant individuals from the profession who are LGBT generally or at the very least are very significant allies. Mm. Uh, it's a safe space to come along and be yourselves. And some some teams choose to wear their LGBT-ness um, on their, very openly on their sleeve. Mm -hmm. uh, that's delightful to see. It's lovely to see. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody has, and then we have um, drinks on the, Friday evening and the Saturday and, and then a, a sort of get together on Saturday evening after the final. And, and it's just a, um, you know, I've always found mooting fun. Uh, if you want to be a barrister and you don't find mooting fun, you've made the wrong choice. <laughs> uh, so go, go and do something else. Um, uh, it, it, it can be fun and scary all at the same time. Um, I remember mooting, my, I'm a member of Greys, and I remember mooting um, as part of my dinners uh, in front of some really quite senior members of the inn. Um, and that should feel a bit scary, which it did. Mm -hmm. But equally, it's lovely when, you know, they give you nice feedback or you've done well. Um, uh, we uh, we don't make people stand on tables or things that the feathers can moot. Um, and of course, it, it is sponsored. And it's called the, the Featherstone Moot because it's sponsored by Lynn Featherstone, who was responsible, who was the Liberal Democrat um, minister, who was responsible for same-sex marriage. So um, it's a great moment for people, um, both students and much more senior people, to get together uh, and celebrate our part of the profession. Mm. Fantastic. I um, was really keen to get involved in the MOOC, but it's on my birthday this year, unfortunately, so I didn't sign up, but I definitely will be next year. Um, but any anyone who's listening who's keen to get involved, um, yes, as Robin said, mooting can be really scary, but you just have to you just have to go for it. I'm actually doing a MOOC at Grey's Inn today, um, and if you don't know the process, you usually get the bundle maybe 48 hours before. You read it, prepare it. If you really don't understand it, maybe do like a little um, like a timeline of the events. Um, but yeah, you just chop through it and you also usually are paired up unless it's like mini mooting, you're paired up with someone so you can lean on that person. They probably will have mooted before or if they haven't, you're going through the experience together. Um, so it's a really nice thing to do and it, it definitely does uh, sort of help you work out if you want to be a barrister or not. Because like you said, if you don't enjoy it, maybe this isn't the path for you um, or maybe just keep going and give it a couple of goes and see what you think. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for shedding light on the Featherstone moot. Um, moving on to a different uh, sort of experience or opportunities that you've taken up. I also mentioned earlier that you have lectured on transgender rights and that you also published a practical guide to transgender law. Um, in addition to this, you've also appeared on podcasts for the Law Society. Um, you did one on gender fluid inclusion within the legal profession and you've written lots of articles. So, for example, you wrote supporting LGBT plus clients for the Law Society Gazette. You also wrote What is a Woman for Personnel Today and you also wrote Gender Wars, Two Opposing Perspectives on the Trans and Women's Right Debate for Prospect. Um, so as a barrister with a busy practice, what has motivated you to also take the time to get involved in lectures, podcasts and articles with a focus on LGBTQ plus issues, rights and inclusion? Well, a few other things as well. I've been privileged to give evidence to the Women and Equality Select Committee of the House of Commons on a couple of occasions. Mm. Uh, and the equivalent committee in Scotland on the gender recognition reform bill as it went through um, the process. Mm. Um, and I've been, you know, and, and been called to be on national television a couple of times. So um, 
it's political law is important mm. because that's how we carry rights forward. You know, there is um, we were Britain was first in, in the Cameron Featherston era. We were at the forefront of minority rights. Um, we're now about 20th down the list mm. um, and falling. Uh, and people need to understand why those minority rights are important. Why, for example, granting trans people additional rights uh, or making access to those rights easier does not threaten women and girls. Mm. Um, and there is a nasty use of that uh, false equivalence, uh, which is being used to, um, the political use is really to suggest that the people who are resisting trans rights are supporting women and girls. And the, the equivalence is wrong. That's uh, just, it's just plain wrong. Mm. Um, and we are being left behind in the world in terms of um, that move to uh, recognising that gender is what they say it is. I mean, OK, mm. there will always be the occasional bad actors who need to be protected against, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't give rights to the thousands of people who are not in that category. I mean, we don't, I mean, the, the example I use is criminals use telephones, but we don't therefore ban the use of mobile telephones by every citizen because mm -hmm. criminals use telephones. Um, we What we do is we criminalise criminal use of telephones, mm -hmm. um, and respect the, the, the average citizen's ability to use, uh, use equipment, you know, um, in an appropriate way. Absolutely. Yeah, when you mentioned that we were sort of 20 years behind, I noticed in your the article that you wrote um, alongside or that was written at sort of interviewing alongside Kathleen, um, showing different perspectives on trans issues that you said um, the 2004 Gender Recognition Act, um, which provides for medically based panel assessed gender recognition is almost two decades old. So that means we're falling behind other liberal Western democracies. Um, Next year, it will be two decades old. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, we spoke to someone from uh, Ireland in the series and it's sort of at self ID came up and Ireland has had that for a very long time. We can see it's tried and tested. It's working out well for them. So it's sh sort of shocking that we aren't moving a little bit faster in that um, sort of respect. Um, but yeah, also on the your analogy of the phone was fantastic and you've used analogies quite a lot, like you mentioned in terms of um, rights that um, there's sort of this thought that freedom and liberty is sort of like a cake. Um, and you've addressed this, and I've seen this stressed elsewhere as well, that it's not like a cake. It's not like if, if one person has more freedom, that another person has less um, at all. And it shouldn't be uh, sort of thought of in that way. And you said that a far better metaphor is that of an incoming tide that floats all boats. So um, yeah, I think it's it's something that um, is definitely needs to be looked at. And I, I love your use of analogies. And I think they're fantastic um, when discussing trans rights. Um, so overall, the message would be then that you think that it's important to keep talking about these issues. And that's why you have got involved in so many different things with your time. Um, and I think that's fantastic. I, and I think you win the future one person at a time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. OK, so um, sort of on that topic as well, actually, um, about keeping an open discussion and um, continuing to talk about things as much as we can. We invited questions um, from people within the community and outside the community that they were too afraid to ask or that they didn't have someone that they could ask. Um, so um, I wondered if there were any of the questions that you would be happy to address. Um, if you'd like for me to pick one, I'm happy to pick one. You, or if carry, there... you carry on and pick them. OK, perfect. So um, one question that someone asked was, what do I do if people I'm friends with or people at work feel negatively about someone else that is a member of the LGBTQ plus community? How would I respond to this? Well, I think um, that I mean, it, it's no one's responsibility to mm. fight for the whole, the whole of a community. You know, it you may not feel confident as an individual to, to launch into the middle of a discussion, mm. uh, but you may. 
uh, and or what you might do is take the person aside and say, is there really, you know, is your fear really le legitimate? What is it that you're afraid of? What is it that you're afraid of happening, for example? And mm -hmm. so on gender self ID, I mean, we have, we effectively have gender self ID at the moment. Um, I mean, I'll, you know, if I'm shopping in Sainsbury's on Saturday and I head to the, head to the toilets in the supermarket and I, and I use a particular set of toilets, then mm -hmm. I'm identifying myself with the group of people who use that set of to toilets, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, what is, uh, what would change if we had um, uh, gender self ID as opposed to uh, medically determined certificates? Nothing. In t I mean, you don't take your birth certificate along to identify which set of facilities you use. And talking that through with pe people don't, people won't have thought about that. Um, and, you know, there are some simple things that you can think through and talk through with people. And a proportion of people will go, yeah, you're right. Mm. I mean, a proportion of people will go, well, there should be someone on the door checking. Um, well, you're never going to win those people. Mm. But the proportion of people who will stop and think and think, well, actually, you don't carry your birth certificate around with you. Um, you know, we do take people, 99% of people are good, honest, straightforward citizens just going about their business. Mm. And yes, there are bad people out there and we need to, you know, have systems that protect against those. But not such that, that take the enjoyment of a Saturday's shopping away from the other 99%. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're so right there. And on the occasions where I have challenged people, maybe challenge isn't the best word, maybe uh, sort of invited discussion from someone who's made a comment or something else that might be um, negative or offensive. Usually they actually haven't meant what they said. They might be parroting someone else or they might have just made a mistake, whatever it might be. They usually are quite receptive to um, your thoughts and your comments. And um, a response from someone that I uh, sort of corrected was, yeah, that makes complete sense. Once I took the time to explain why what he said was offensive and why something else might be a better way to put it, he just said that makes sense. And it's it's scary thought to interject or to intervene, but it's definitely something that's worthwhile to reduce sort of discomfort or hurt in the future. Um, Robin, would you mind if I asked you one more question or are you... Carry on. Rush. Okay, so um, another question that someone asked that I think it'd be really nice if we could address was they said that someone I know has asked that they are addressed with pronouns that I'm not used to. I want to get this right. Do you have any advice to help to make sure that I don't keep getting it wrong? Um, yeah, well, firstly, you know, you, you can do your own research. So, mm -hmm. so look up on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, if... Um, if you haven't heard someone correctly, you know, nothing wrong. That is, that's just like not having heard their name correctly. Mm. Nothing wrong with asking them to, um, you know, how do you pronounce that? As long as you are not, or how do you write that? Mm. As long as you're not showing ridicule. It's mm. not, how do you write that? Would be the wrong way to ask the question, obviously. Um, if what you're genuinely doing is wanting to get things right, never a problem to ask. I mean, my chambers had to. We we have a couple of non-binary clients um, and we discovered that our billing system could not send out an invoice with an MX marker. It, it yeah. just wasn't on the system because nobody had ever asked, you know, the, the system, the software that is sold to Barristers Chambers to produce invoices did not have an MX uh, option. And we spoke, our facilities lady spoke to the provider who over a weekend reprogrammed it so that it did have an MX option on the Monday. And they were very appreciative and they said, we, we hadn't thought about this. We were prompted to think about it by what you did. We've contacted all the other people to whom we sell this software and said, here's a little upgrade for you. Um, and we've had nothing but, you know, positive comments back that says keeping up with uh, society and and so the comment from the software company was and and there was no charge as well 
and the comment from the software company was you know thank you for making us think about um the ways in which we need to keep up with modern society mm. I think that's a fantastic comparison you made as well about the name, because if you didn't quite catch someone's name, you probably would just listen to the rest of the conversation and hope that it came up again. Um, or you would say politely, I'm really sorry I didn't catch your name. Um, and then your pronouns are as important to you as your name is, and they're as personal to you as your name is. Um, and you, you know, I, so yeah. I think that's a good way to. Question. There was a little bit of a question that said about getting it right. Mm. Now, it's like when um, and we invented MS. Mm -hmm. as a way of referring to women that was not miss or missus mm -hmm. and i think that came in in the 1970s now there would have been a time when that was unusual to people and people would have to get used to doing that they would make mm -hmm. mistakes we, we will always human beings the nature of human beings is to make mistakes and the right thing to do is to apologize put it right and carry on and yeah. and then work harder to get it right and, and in a sense use that mistake as a prompt to get it right the next time. Um, because when I'm talking to trans people, I say, people are gonna get it wrong. You know, that's the nature of life, is that if, for example, you've transitioned and someone's known you uh, as one gender for 20 years, and now they've got to get used to knowing you as another gender, they're gonna make mistakes. Mm -hmm. They're human beings. And you don't, you don't win them over by snapping at them being unfortunate to them being nasty to them you help them mm -hmm. now it's very different if people are doing something deliberately and nastily but if they're making a mistake you know um to her is human yeah absolutely i read an article by a trans person who gave their experience of this and they said it's sort of like if you're in a really busy room and someone steps backwards and they step on your foot and they've hurt you, but they didn't mean to hurt you. So in that situation, if you stepped on someone's foot, you'd apologise, but then you'd sort of quickly, you'd apologise to acknowledge that what you've done is wrong and that what you've done is, has hurt them. But that doesn't mean both people in that situation know it was a mistake, but you still say sorry, and then you both just move on. You don't make a drama out of it, or you don't sort of create a scene. That's just like, that. that's how the interaction goes. And he said that that is how he would like to experience it if someone misgendered him or used the wrong pronouns. Um, so I thought that was perhaps since we've talked about analogies, that might be quite a good analogy for the situation. But I think take, right. maybe take it a step further and make sure you're not in a bustling room next time. But um, yeah. No, it's a good one. I have um, I will add that to my stable of analogies. <laughs> Fantastic. OK, so um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, um, this is an aid of LGBTQ plus history month. Um, so I just wondered if you perhaps had a favourite iconic member of the LGBT community that might have inspired you. Um, do I? Um, well, I have to say that I, so I was brought up in rural Somerset mm -hmm. uh, before the internet existed. I know, I know I, people don't believe me that there was a time before the internet existed, um, but but there was. And there was a time when we only had three TV channels as well down in, in the West Country. And, um, oh dear, I've, my, my mind's gone blank. And I knew I was a trans person because I saw a program about Juliet somebody or other, who mm -hmm. was a trans woman, who one of the very first out trans women in the 1970s um and if anything she um because because i thought i was the only person mm. you know i was the only person who felt this way i didn't know there were other trans people in the world um and um suddenly there was another trans person in the world and that that was a very 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 big thing for me mm. um and she appeared on bbc2 late one night um and it was a revelation that that there was someone else like me in the world and now people today don't have to um experience that degree of loneliness fortunately mm. um that that i did but juliet grant that's right juliet grant great fantastic the old the old memory of that's why you know um i need to stick a, a, a winder in my ear and when the memory of it came. Um, but I 
think that was the person who made it plain to me that, you know, that I wasn't alone. And that was tremendous. Yeah, I think that's something that's really important about LGBTQ plus History Month, because um, as much as it is about looking at how far we've come and um, sort of looking at the barriers that we still need to overcome, it's also really important to look at the um, the historical figures because we've spoken a lot about role models and in the future seeing someone that looks like you but it's also really nice to see people in the past who have looked like you and to know there always have been trans people or there always have been um, other people in the LGBTQ plus community and there's something in that that makes you feel so much more reassured I think that's particularly important perhaps for trans people because there's some unfortunately some um thought that there are more trans people now and there's like discussions about um children being trans but you can see very clearly that there have always been trans people so um i think that's really helpful and i'll definitely look up juliet okay so over to you i just wondered if there's anything that you wanted to add or to emphasize from our conversation today or maybe just a closing note to leave people with who are listening um don't worry about the, the the nastiness that's about at the moment it it will pass mm. be yourself build your support networks be the best person that you can in whatever it is that you do um have those hands around you to hold when you need them um and live your life and enjoy your life and i have i've i've lived a tremendously privileged life uh, I perhaps transitioned later than I might have done um, had I been born later. But, um, you know, grasp the opportunities that come along in life. Um, you only get one and they don't, you know, they don't add to the, they don't add bits on, I'm afraid. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. That's really, um, that's a great note to leave it on, I think.